and welcome Luca to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start with a scenario in which uh, you all imagine that you're doing a fundraiser. So uh, you're super passionate about Against Malaria Foundation and you decided that you're going to do a fundraiser for them on their behalf. Um, so you might be doing an event or might, you might be running a marathon or uh, some other a little bit out there thing to get your friends, family, uh, colleagues, um, fellow students to donate to your fundraiser. Um, so you kick things off and one of your mates calls you up and they say that they're going to donate $35 to your fundraiser and you say thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, because that's a great gift and then you continue with your fundraising efforts. Then about two or three days later, the same friend calls you up again and said uh, that she's changed her mind. She now wants to donate $500 instead of the 35. And you go, wow, that's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. Um, but then you go, uh, you wonder what made you uh, make that change to go from $35 to 500. Well, this scenario pretty much happened to me uh, about eight years ago. The only difference was that I wasn't doing a fundraiser for uh, the Against Malaria Foundation. I was working as a fundraiser for UNICEF at the time, and one of our donors uh, called us to uh, increase his monthly donation from $35 to $500 uh, a month. I said thank you, thank you, thank you, and um, probably a few of those thank yous, and at the end I asked him, why he had made that decision to increase his monthly gift so much. And this was eight years ago, so I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but it went something along the lines of, oh, I read this book by this dude called Peter Singer, it's called The Life You Can Save, and I've decided to completely change my giving. <clears throat> At that time, I'd never heard about the book before, so I ran down to the bookstore, of course, to uh, grab a copy. I read the book and I absolutely loved it. Um, there were so many things about the book that I really liked. Uh, the main argument, of course, uh, how to uh, respond to common objections about helping, um, how human nature plays into our giving decisions, and the idea of changing the culture of giving. Uh, also, the facts about charity or aid, and uh, the final sort of call to action in the book to uh, put in a new uh, standard for giving. I admit at the time that I got a little bit nervous because as a fundraiser I thought, oh, maybe this is the end of the fundraising career because organizations will just be able to buy the book and put it in the mail and give people the book and people will start giving a lot more straight away. <laughs> and, well, it's almost 10 years since the book came out and I think it's clear to say uh, that it's had tremendous impact. Uh, unfortunately though, it's not that easy to, to just send the book to people and it'll start giving, but it is a very, very helpful tool uh, to get people engaged and start giving more. I wouldn't mind stopping there for a second just to see, um, ask a few questions. Uh, first of all, uh, just hands up if uh, everyone who went to the keynote on Friday and heard Peter Singer talk, yeah, all of you, uh, pretty much. And how many people had heard about the book before uh, today? Quite a few. How many people have read the book? Quite a few people as well. Cool. I expected so much. Uh, anyone who would like to read the book that hasn't? Yeah. Quite a few. Well, the good news is that I've got one here, as you've seen, and I'm going to give it away uh, right here, right now. Uh, it's very, very, very easy. Uh, you just have to complete four actions, and they're very easy. I'm going to read them up now, and you can do them in real time. The person who does it the fastest will get the free copy of the book. Are you ready? Um, all right, so the first step, very simple, grab your phone. Uh, second step is to uh, head over to our website, thelifeyoucansave.org. Once you get to the bottom uh, of the page on the Life uh, You Can Save, you'll see a sign-up form for our newsletter. Just put in your name and email, sign up, and once you've done that step, scream, done. And the person who does that the first will uh, get the book. Anyone working on it? A few people working on it? Done. Done. It was that. Okay. 
So, um, our why, why are we doing this? Why are we uh, up and running as an organization? Well, uh, here are two of the main reasons. Um, an estimated 5.6 million children die before they reach their fifth birthday, and most of those are preventable. There's been some tremendous progress in this area lately. Um, about 10 years ago when Peter wrote the book, that same figure was 8 million, so there is progress happening. Uh, but what we think is important is that most of those are preventable, so we know what to do to save those lives, uh, but the gap is usually around funding. So if we can get more funds, uh, we can make a lot more progress and save a, mo a lot more lives quickly. The other one is uh, that 676 million people still live in extreme poverty. Uh, again, there's been a lot of uh, progress. I think in 1990, uh, since 1990, 1.1 billion people have been moved out of poverty, so there is progress. But again, there's more that we can do. Funding is also or often a, a key concern. So if we can get more funding, we can get more progress quicker. Um, and our nonprofit nonprofit is dedicated to promoting effective giving, including recommending a list of charities uh, that provide highly effective uh, interventions addressing global extreme poverty. So that's what we do. Um, we have a very, very easy message, a simple message. Each of us has the opportunity to save lives. And you would have heard that before. Um, and we like to keep it simple, so that's what we're sticking with. Um, then this is the part of the presentation that in the future when I hold it for an audience that has not or recently heard Peter singing talk and has not spent two days at an EA conference, we'll talk a little bit more about our tools around effective giving. So our main tool uh, to help people understand about effective giving is of course the book, but we also have other resources on our website uh, that people can explore to learn about this subject a little bit more. But I think. Uh, at this time, um, we're going to just skip that a little bit. But I wanted to flag one thing that has become quite topical in the last uh, couple of weeks, and that is uh, scope uh, intensity and uh, intensitivity. Um, and that really is around the concept of if one person dies, it's a tragedy. If a million die, it's a st statistic. I'm sure you would all have heard and read and seen about the uh, uh, Thai boys trapped in the cage, uh, cave that captured the world's attention. Uh, I think it was 12 boys, and people talked about it for about two weeks or more, and a lot of resources were put into it. Um, well, Peter and our executive director, Charlie, uh, recently just wrote a, a short comment on that that was published in the New York, New York Times the other day. Um, it's a really good piece. If you haven't seen it, log on to our uh, different social channels. We posted it there, have read uh, through it, and ideally share it with others as well. That would be fantastic. Um, a little bit about our results uh, to date. So, last year uh, we moved around 3.6 million to our recommended nonprofits while spending less than 300k on expenses. And that means that for every dollar that we invested, uh, we helped raise around or more than $12 for our uh, nonprofits. And that's good, we think, but we would like to raise a lot more. We also uh, grew a little bit in terms of effectiveness. We, we moved up, uh, we moved 33% more than in 2016. Um, uh, but again, it's relatively small numbers. We'd like that to be 30 or 300 million uh, instead of 3.6. So that's really what we're aiming for. We want to grow bigger uh, so that we can solve all of these problems uh, faster. We really be believe that we have a powerful and compelling argument to make, and we want new people to hear it and support our recommended nonprofits. Um, Speaking about nonprofits, uh, I'd like to talk about them now for a little bit. We have currently 20 of them on our list, and you can view the full list on our website. Uh, just to keep in mind that if tax deductibility is important to you, only six of those uh, can pro currently provide tax deductibility in Australia. So if that's important, keep that in mind when you make a donation. And you can use the uh, filter on the top of the pages to uh, show you which ones uh, offer that in Australia right now. But over the last two days, I've had a couple of questions about how we select our uh, different charities. And uh, we have a panel of experts uh, curating our charity recommendations. 
but they aggregate uh, the best research from outside sources and add additional scrutiny. And the panel consists of uh, experts in economics, ethics, nonprofit management, and business, and Peter is one of those uh, members. But instead of going out and, and doing all the research, as I said, we, we look at other resources. So two of the main sources that we look at for the recommendations is AgiWell, that you probably are very familiar with by now after the conference, uh, and also Impact Matters. And now I'd like to talk about one of uh, those recommended charities, and this is DREV. And up here you see uh, Lata and Baby Johnson. Baby Johnson, who at one point suffered from severe jaundice. Um, and here in Australia, that's not a big problem. Most, uh, a lot of our babies have it when they're born, but uh, it's easily treatable. Uh, however, uh, in other parts of the world, that's not quite the case. Uh, if left untreated or ineffectively treated, it can have many consequences, including severe brain damage or even death. Here in Australia, if it happens, you go to the hospital, uh, the doctor or nurses flick a switch on a blue lamp and you lay under the lamp for a little bit and you're usually fine after a couple of days. Uh, but the problem is that in a lot of de developing countries, uh, that equipment is too expensive. Uh, one of those big lamps uh, costs around three grand and also the bulbs are really um, expensive and hard to find when they break. But DREV designs and delivers affordable and innovative medical devices to protect and transform lives of the global poor. And one of their products, <clears throat> the Brilliance uh, Phototherapy Lamp, costs around $400 instead of the uh, 3000 that I mentioned before. Plus, their bulbs are uh, used as LED bulbs, uh, which rarely need replacing, so they're a lot easier to maintain as well. Uh, they have a lot of interesting uh, information on the website. I highly recommend uh, checking it out and reading a little bit more about their innovations. It's pretty cool. The next uh, organization that I would like to talk about is One Acre Fund. How many people here are familiar with One Acre Fund? Hands up, yeah, a few. Um, they're a non-profit uh, and social enterprise that supplies financing and training to um, help smallhood growers uh, find their way out of poverty themselves by, tr by providing, as I said, uh, financing and training. At the moment, uh, they're working with more than 600,000 uh, farmers, and their goal is to reach 1 million farmers by 2020, and they're growing really, really fast. So they're, uh, they're actually on, on track to do this. Um, in terms of how they help, they boost the farming uh, productivity by incre increasing harvest per acre, acre sorry, uh, sales and income. And they provide farmers with startup financing, seeds, fertilizers, agriculture training and market facilitation to help maximize profit. And this here is Moses, uh, he works for them uh, in Uganda. I found a blog that he had written a few uh, uh, weeks ago on their website and thought it was really good. He talks about what it's like to work in that capacity. Uh, again, they have a great website, so I highly recommend checking it out too. And um, Google uh, One Acre Fund and TED Talk, and you'll find their funder uh, TED Talk, which is, again, a really good resource. Just moving over to some of our plans. Uh, so as I said, we really want to grow money uh, that we move to charities, and we've done some good work so far, but we really want to become a lot bigger to address some of the big problems. Uh, some of the things that we're doing is we'll be launching the Life You Can Save Australia uh, later in the year, which we are very excited about. Um, what that means is uh, hopefully that we'll be able to provide more giving options uh, to donors based in Australia, and we'll have more activities happening in happening in Australia as well. Uh, we're also exploring opportunities in India. Uh, our executive director is traveling to India next week, I think it is, and uh, what we're doing is exploring a, a model of the life you can save that can work in India. It would be a little bit different from the current version in that it would only recommend organizations working in India and mainly f focus on fundraising in India for those projects. And Yes, next year, um, the book will actually turn 10, which I think is 
crazy. I feel like it was just yesterday I found the book and started reading it, but that's happening. So we're looking to do some um, promotion around that as well. Really want to have a, a big campaign around it to get more people involved and uh, read the book uh, next year. We are also looking to expand the giving game concept. Have you heard about the giving game concept? A few people, yeah. Have you taken part in the concept before? Tried a workshop? Yeah, cool. Uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So, the giving games uh, are a method of teaching people about charitable giving, and they employ experiential philanthropy and participants learn by giving away real money to real charities. So basically, if people want to hold the giving game to teach people about it, uh, the Life You Can Save has a specific fund uh, where we can sometimes provide money to help this uh, happen. Uh, so it's a 60 to 90 minute workshop, and participants hear an introduction about all the concepts, they learn a little bit about different charities, and then they have a discussion, and at the end they actually get to give away real money. So usually around 20 to $30 to their favorite charity based on the discussion that they've just had. And by doing uh, this, by framing giving as a choice between good, and, um, between good options, it encourages people to be intentional, intentional informed, and impact, impactful in their giving. Uh, we also think it's a really exciting opportunity for donors uh, because most of the time the money ends up going to uh, effective charities. So if you're already giving to an effective charity um, and you would like more people to know about the concepts, you could give money to the, the giving game uh, and at the same time train a lot of people uh, uh, by, by taking part of this, in this concept and still get, give money to the, the effective charities. Um, if you want to know more about it, uh, the man to speak to is named John, and you can reach him at givinggames at thelifeyoucansave.org. In terms of getting involved, there's plenty of things uh, that can be done, of course. Um, my background is in fundraising, and we're all about raising funds, so the, the main call to action is to jump on the website and donate money to the, uh, one of our recommended charities. As I said, there are six of them at the moment that you can get a tax and deductible gift, uh, receipt from. Um, so I highly recommend that if you haven't done it. Um, also, for those of you who didn't uh, get too tempted about my offer to get a free book by signing up to the newsletter, I still want you to sign up to the newsletter if you haven't. <laughs> and there's two of them to sign up to, actually. There's the, the one that I talked about before on our website, uh, but we also have the newsletter for the Melbourne chapters. Um, and we have some um, uh, a sign-up sheet at the back that people can sign up to or speak to Chris, uh, and uh, we can make that happen. Of course, we'd love for people to read the book uh, again or for the first time and talk to others about it as well. And um, also share Peter's TED talk around this uh, concept, especially around uh, peak giving season. So the end of the financial year that just uh, was a couple of weeks ago, but also uh, around Christmas. That's really helpful to help drive traffic to our website and get people to donate to effective uh, organizations. Uh, I didn't put volunteering up there yet because I don't know exactly what the organization will need in terms of volunteering, but if you're interested in that, please uh, touch base with me uh, via email or on LinkedIn. Uh, so I will be putting together a list of volunteering opportunities uh, and they'll probably uh, kick in from, say, October sometime this year. Um, And then I'd just like to finish off with uh, another quote from Peter, and that is, of course, that we can make progress with poverty if we are careful about the way in which we do it and fund organizations that, we are open to, uh, that are open to evidence about what works and what doesn't. Again, thank you very, very much. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now, of course. Uh, and then I would love to connect our either on LinkedIn or by email later on as well. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll get straight into questions. Um, how does the Life You Can Save avoid replicating the work of GiveWell? What drives the differences in charity recommendations? Yeah, so uh, addressing the first point, so there's obviously a lot of similarities. Um, 
but in terms of uh, collaborating with other like-minded organizations, we do that and I think we'll be doing that uh, a lot more going forward as well. So, for example, uh, here in Australia we had a meeting with uh, Bridget and Ben from EAA to uh, see how we can work together to avoid duplication. Uh, in terms of give well, so we work with them, we use their recommendations for um, the websites and we're probably going to have a conversation with them uh, around fundraising as well to see how we can uh, really work to together around fundraising and driving um, uh, yeah, interest in this course together rather than sort of trying to, to fight around it. Yep, great. And sorry, what drives the differences? With give well and... Um, and even EA Australia. EA Australia, I think EA Australia is going to be broader than the life we can say. We're very focused on just one, uh, basically one way of supporting, which is giving. Uh, and uh, we focus on one issue as well. And EA, as you know, is a lot broader than that. So I think that's one thing. And then on, on this topic, we'll uh, work together as, as, as close as we can to uh, avoid duplication. Great, thank you. And the advocate for charities, so it's broader. For the time being, yep, yep. Um, how did you get into a fundraising career? Um, I had always been interested in this space and doing something good with my career. I didn't know how it was going to work. Uh, I did a business degree at UTS in Sydney. But while I was doing that, I went to Malawi as well on a trip, which influenced me quite a lot. And uh, when I came back, I decided that I wanted to find something else other than sort of selling, um, I don't know, Coca-Cola, wherever it might be. Um, and I applied for a job after uni with UNICEF, and I got it, and I've been stuck ever since in a good way. <laughs> That's great. Um, what other creative and interactive ways are effective in increasing donations besides the giving game? Um, really good content. Uh, having really passionate people uh, that can talk about it, spread the word, is super important. There's so many misconceptions and objections to giving, so the more the people that um, know what works, can talk about works, what, what works with people is, is so helpful. It might not seem like a lot, but I think it's really the, the, the key. So having a, a big group of people that um, can sort of fight some of the misconceptions around it uh, is super important. Um, and then I think it's just different types of marketing or sales. So um, a lot of organizations look at uh, one strategy for people that might be able to give uh, significant money, um, like hundreds of thousands of do dollars. And then they would have another strategy for, uh, say, digital marketing uh, to uh, try to increase interest and drive people to websites and make that first donation. Um, and just to follow on from that, uh, what are some ineffective ways? Ooh, I think that depends on um, perhaps the organization and the course and, and how they execute it. Um, I, I can't think of one that is really ineffective. I haven't. Sponsorships? Do you think that's? In terms of sponsorship or uh, like child sponsorship, yeah. or, uh, they worked really well to get a lot of people engaged in, in these courses. I don't, I don't, I'm not a big believer in them myself, but wow. they do. Um, I think they misrepresent the truth too much, uh, and uh, it's, yeah, it's just not really reflective of how things work. Um, could you go into a little more detail about the giving game? Is that an activity to be had amongst people at a dinner party or a larger group of people who are there specifically for learning about charity? I think everywhere. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, so yeah, with friends, uh, with fellow students uh, in, uh, at work, really getting uh, colleagues on board with it. I think it's a, a great uh, opportunity. Uh, for example, with corporate partnerships, we know now that corporate uh, businesses tend to select their charity partners based on what their staff uh, are interested in. And uh, as you know, quite a uh, small proportion of um, uh, people tend to be interested in, in this course and want to give to this course. So if we can get more people, at, especially big companies, that have a lot of money to spend to be more interested in um, effective courses, I think there could be a big follow-on effect as well for the companies to sort of start giving more attention to those areas. Um, so this is a bit of a difficult question, but um, how do you feel about Peter Singer's more controversial views, e.g. towards disability? Um, yes, uh, well I think, I have a, obviously he's got a lot of strong views on a lot of uh, uh, topics and I don't agree with all of them, but also think that we need to be very open to working with people that just don't think like us. Stay curious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and final question, are you familiar with the Effective Altruism Fund? Would you recommend donating to the Global Development Fund? Um, I'm not, unfortunately, but yeah. Um, who 
ask that question? Or, yeah. uh, Bridget, did you want to yeah. answer that? Yeah, so, um, So for people who don't know, um, the Centre for Effective Altruism has this thing called EA Funds, which allows people to donate to um, uh, across different cause areas. So there's a global poverty one, there's an animal welfare one, a long-term future one, I think. I've actually looked at it recently. Um, and you can kind of allocate your donations with across those or donate just to one. Um, the, and with the, the global poverty one, um, I think in the past most of the donations have gone towards AMF, but I have to double check that. So I don't think there's too much advantage to Australians donating by EA funds um, for global poverty, because you, you can't get eligible for a tax benefit on those donations, if that's important to you. Um, but just more broadly, I guess the benefits of EA funds, the idea is that if everybody pulls their donations, then there's one person who does like a whole lot of research about where the very best place to donate to is, and in the future, um, that, that might change, so it might not be payment forever, it might not just follow kind of give our recommendations. But, um, yeah, does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right, I know you have to head straight to the airport now, so I'll let you go, but thank you so much. Could you all join me in thanking Rick? Thank you. Thank you.